Welcome to Let's Talk Cancer. I'm Kerry Adams, the CEO of UICC. Antimicrobial resistance, or drug resistance, is a serious health threat to humanity. Today, around 1.27 million people die every year as a direct result of drug-resistant infections. By 2050, this number could reach 10 million and cost a cumulative $100 trillion of economic output without collective action. Drug resistance occurs when germs are not killed by the medicines designed to destroy them. Why? Because the overuse or misuse of today's antibiotics and other antimicrobials makes them ineffective over time. They simply don't work. Drug-resistant infections are especially dangerous for cancer patients because the treatment they receive exposes them to a greater likelihood of infection. Few people know that today. Infection has become the second leading cause of death in patients with cancer. To mark World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, we speak to Kevin Utterson, Executive Director of CarbX, an international public-private partnership to accelerate global antibacterial innovation. Kevin, welcome, and thank you very much for giving us your time today. Always happy to do anything to, to help the fight against cancer. Now, the WHO has added antimicrobial resistance to its list of 10 biggest threats to health worldwide. So perhaps to begin with, could you explain why antimicrobial resistance occurs and why it's becoming such a major health risk? When you think about different types of medicine, uh, antibiotics are probably the one of the most important classes of drug in human history. They, they've really done amazing things to extend human lifespan. Uh, but most drugs, um, you know, aspirin, for example, it, it's going to work just as well on you today as it will on our grandchildren in 50 years or 100 years. Um, aspirin will always work. Uh, heart disease drugs will always work. You know, if there's amazing prevention or cures from cancer, it should always work. Um, the difference is that for anything with a microbial target, antiviral, antibacterial, um, you have to worry about evolution. You have to worry about the target, the microorganism, changing over time and therefore becoming resistant. So for, for antibiotics, penicillin was an amazing discovery. But as soon as we started using it, we needed to start discovering another penicillin just to avoid falling behind. Uh, so it's different from anything else that we've looked at. And uh, we've become so used to having these drugs, these uh, amazing, you know, miracle, the original miracle drug, that uh, we don't understand that we have to work hard just to avoid slipping behind. We have um, in UICC been looking at this for the last year and a half because it was raised with us by certain cancer societies that they were seeing like one in five cancer patients were actually uh, being affected by an infection. And many of those led to them being in intensive care as a result of that infection. So what is it about cancer patients specifically, do you feel, that, that leaves them open to antibiotic uh, resistance? I published together with some infectious disease physicians uh, a review that looked at this issue in the clinical journal of the American Cancer Society uh, last year. And uh, but anyone here who's you know a survivor of cancer or has a friend or family member who's gone through cancer, you understand how invasive some of the treatments are. You know the visits to hospital, the openings into the skin that are required for treatments, uh, the fact that some of these treatments suppress or modify your immune system in ways that might be killing the cancer but make you more vulnerable, and so you have to be more careful about the other things in life. You total all these things up, and the data shows that while antimicrobial resistance superbugs are a problem for everyone, for people with cancer, the risks are really three times higher uh, that they'll get a fatal infection from these superbugs uh, because of all the things that cancer treatment does to you know, make you higher risk. Wonderful treatment, but uh, like you said before, we we want to be careful that uh, the advances in cancer aren't undermined by the old foe of infection. Certainly, UICC is working hard to sensitize the cancer community about this issue because many of the people I talk to aren't aware of the, the challenges that AMR poses to cancer treatment in the future. And we want 
the cancer community to be ambassadors for the MR story, that they are there talking to governments and, and hopefully get them to think differently about how antibiotics are used in their country and around the world. Now, one of the things in your report that you mentioned, you, you talked about the need for AMR surveillance systems for cancer patients. Perhaps you could give us a little bit more about that because we do struggle as a cancer community anyway with just basic information through cancer registries. Perhaps you could expand on why you think AMR surveillance systems for, for cancer patients are so important. We were surprised when we did the review just how little detailed data there was. Uh, that tracked in in a careful way using medical records as well as just top-line statistics on the experience of cancer patients with infection and and particularly with drug-resistant infection. And so, um, you know, when when a a cancer patient, you know, dies, uh, even if the actual cause of death was uh, a drug-resistant infection, that's almost never shown on the death certificate. Uh, Something else is almost always there. Uh, maybe the cancer itself, the underlying cause of death, but the proximate cause uh, was the infection that interrupted the course of treatment that may have been working. So we think that there's a need for a, a lot more data to understand what is the actual experience of these patients with infection, uh, what sort of drugs are they receiving. Um, most of those anti-infective drugs, you know, the antibiotics and whatnot, uh, antifungals as well, are really amazingly inexpensive. It's you know, <laughs> there's been lots of complaints about the cost of cancer therapy, but um, the antibiotics are like the uh, the bargain um, in, in this process. But we what we don't know is how many patients uh, with cancer are are failing sp- from specific drugs becoming resistant, and then what are we going to do to make sure that you know in five or ten years we have a replacement. For those things that are failing today. And your organization, which you know you're the founder of, I believe, um, Carbex, it stands for Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria Biopharmaceutical Accelerator, which is a mouthful in itself. But yeah, you can see why we call ourselves Carbex. <laughs> I prefer Carbex. It's a lot easier for me. It's a lot easier for me. Uh, but I mean, the other side of the coin of this is okay, we want to see antibiotics used more sensibly around the world, not misused or abused in any way. But also we want to develop new uh, ways in which we can uh, address the issue. Um, So what challenges are there in progressing research and development for new treatments? What what are the barriers? Why aren't we seeing more antibiotics coming onto the market? I mean, we see so much investment and so many companies investing in cancer treatment and care, um, a lot of new medicines plan to come out in the next five, 10 years. What, what's, what's stopping us getting new antibiotics? You know, the, the antibacterial research community often looks over longingly at the pipeline and the money going into cancer. <laughs> you know, it says, you know, look, look how many uh, antibiotics we've had in the last decade. Look how many are in the clinical pipeline. It's so few. Uh, compared to the amazing work that's being done over oncology. And if I had to say one word is the, is the difference, it's money. Um, there's great reimbursement. Companies can make money selling cancer drugs. They're having trouble making money selling antibiotics. Uh, the science, amazingly, is is remarkable. All the basic research money that's been going into the NIH and similar agencies around the world uh, remarkable new things coming out in the antibacterial world. Science, I don't think, is the rate limiting step. It's it's money. Uh, we aren't paying for antibiotics as if they're valuable to society. Uh, we're doing that for cancer drugs, and we're getting a lot of them as a result. We haven't done anything similar for antibiotics. It's a real challenge, isn't it? Particularly when you've got a a medicine which actually the more it's used, the less value it is. So that's an unusual market condition, isn't it, for a drug or a medicine to come into into use in health systems around the world. From the language of economics, we'd call it a negative externality, be like a factory that makes something but pollutes all of its neighbors. And uh, antibiotics are a drug class that helps the patient in front of you, but may very well be delivering a less valuable drug or, on the flip side, 
more resistant bacteria to everyone else. And, and so that calls for being really cautious on how we use these drugs. Uh, we don't want to give them inappropriately to any patient because it could damage their microbiome. And it certainly can damage the usefulness of the drug for everybody else, including our children. So um, we want to be careful with them. And that really is the root of the problem, um, is that a new antibiotic is to market uh, for excellent reasons. We put them behind glass and we say, you know, break glass only in case of emergency. We try to use it as little as possible for the first five or 10 or 15 years. But uh, for a company that spent 15 years bringing a product to market, they get FDA approval and then they're told, let's use your brand new drug almost with no one <laughs> for, for as long as we can. Uh, that's a great answer for public health. It's a terrible answer for the company. It's why the majority of them are going bankrupt and leaving the sector. It's why we have so few new drugs, is that reality has penetrated to the boardrooms of the drug companies. We're going to have to find another way of, of rewarding that investment because um, the standard ROA process doesn't work, obviously. The United Kingdom is doing exactly that. They, they have pioneered a new way to pay for antibiotics. Uh, they've selected two antibiotics. They're, you know, those contracts are live now. It's a remarkable first-in-the-world system of really paying us a subscription. Let's pay for the value of having these antibiotics in England without any regard to the volume of sales in the country. So paying for the protection value. There's a proposed legislation in the U.S. There's processes in other G7 countries also looking to do the same. But really, the, the United Kingdom has been the pioneer. and The rest of the, of the leading countries, the wealthy countries of the world, need to follow suit. There are other things as well. What about diagnostics? Um, how is that going? Do you, can you see developments and improvements in the way we can diagnose um, infections? Diagnostics is a key issue. We, we learned so much about the importance of diagnostics in COVID. Uh, we had both positive and negative experiences. We broke the barrier of, of getting you know, rapid diagnostics into the hands of people in their homes. There, there were arguments five years ago that all of us weren't couldn't be trusted to do these t sort of tests at home. It had to be done at a doctor's office. Well, you know, a couple of billion test results later, uh, you know, I think people are pretty comfortable now with lateral flow assay, rapid, uh, rapid tests, and, and do it all the time now. And so the question is, can we get a diagnostic into the hands of, of patients and into the hands of treating physicians, not just in the shiny hospitals and capital cities, but uh, you know, everywhere that patients need this information. Because if you could reliably tell a patient, you don't need an antibiotic, you have a viral infection, we, we save a lot of unnecessary use of antibiotics. And, and also, if you can tell a doctor, this patient, you know, the superbug they have is resistant to everything you would normally give them, and you must get drug X or drug Y, the new things, uh, or else they die. All of that is amazingly important clinical information. So we're, we're working hard to get that done. Uh, there are economic challenges that are different from what I described with antibiotics, but uh, that are daunting in this space. And I'll just say the simplest of them is that if an antibiotic is really inexpensive, you know, $5 or $4, you know, a, a script that you would pick up at, at Walmart, um, a diagnostic that is designed to encourage you not to take that drug if it's going to be cost effective just at that patient silo, uh, the diagnostic has to be almost free. You know, you can't have a $10 diagnostic to save a $5 prescription. So there needs to be some thinking on ways to make the diagnostic free or nearly free, which is what we did with COVID. The PCR test, we got billions of those for, for free from the government because otherwise you, you've put people in an impossible situation. You have to spend more money uh, in order to, to save money by not taking the antibiotic when the antibiotic is so cheap. Let's move on to the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week 2022. Um, the title of that is Preventing Antimicrobial Resistance Together. So let's, let's pick that apart slightly. So uh, it implies obviously prevention. Um, so 
What can be done at global and national level to improve infection prevention and to control it? What, what, is, what is the best practice that you've seen around the world? I think the best infection is the one that never happens. To create a brand new drug is really an amazing scientific and technological feat that takes 15 years and, and lots of money. A similar amount of money spent to improve the quality of the water supply and the sanitation systems in major cities or medium-sized cities and, and poor countries around the world could have a, an amazing impact. We have vaccines that are effective against some bacteria and, and some viruses. And uh, getting those vaccines into the arms of people that would benefit from them is, is really almost everybody uh, is, a, is an amazing cost-effective strategy. So while I at Carvex, you know, focus on you know, trying to get new technologies to the market, it's, it's important that these prevention technologies, whether it be vaccines or clean water, clean food, um, sanitation, that, that these are also advanced. It doesn't matter what the infectious disease threat. If we have a good primary care system, we can, we can deal with it in the first few months while we try to devise something more specific. And similarly, you know, a lot of the reduction in mortality in the wealthier countries in the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century and latter part of the 19th, was due to things as simple as clean water, as profound and powerful as that. So um, it doesn't help if some, a cancer patient gets 21st or 22nd century technology cancer treatment, but then goes home to a situation in which clean water, clean food, and sanitation is not assured. So I believe in prevention. Everyone does. It's, it's a powerful thing, and we need to continue to make the case for it. Which is great. And I, in fact, your prevention is sort of a, a real common theme with the cancer community as well, because, you know, the vaccinations, for example, for um, HPV, avoiding cervical cancer in the future, um, reductions in tobacco use, obesity control, all these things, we know 40 to 50 percent of cancers are caused by modifiable risk factors. So there's a, a lot of alignment um, in the space with our own approach, which is we need to work on one, prevention, two, early detection. Um, and things are a lot easier then. Um, anyway, let's move on to this issue. I mean, I'm actually sitting here wearing my light blue jumper. I noticed that you've got a light blue shirt on. It's the color of AMR awareness. Um, represents a multi-sectoral approach collaboration uh, against a shared health threat. Why do you think it's important that, for example, the cancer community and others get together with the AMR community to actually raise this issue and to take it forward? Communities like cancer can help. You know, there's no march. I live in Boston. Uh, there's a march for a lot of diseases here and causes, and they, they raise great money. And uh, you name it, there's a there's a group for it. Many of them cancer, but not just cancer groups. Very effective patient mobilization. There's not that many patients who are identify as I'm a survivor from a drug resistant infection. <laughs> you know? Now th th there are, there are some groups of this the sepsis alliance there's uh, survivors of a you know, clostridium associated a bacterial disease that results from you know, use of antibiotics that destroys the gut microbiome and then creates a terrible form of diarrhea. The cystic fibrosis community um, in the US this year has made it their top priority to to educate um, US government on the fact that people suffering from CF are now doing better because of the new drugs, much better. But they're still on their last antibiotic. So to the extent that other patient groups rely on antibiotics, this is a good moment for those groups to also stand up and say, yes, uh, we need to keep this thing going because we don't want to wake up one day and find out that all the antibiotics don't work. I mean, the cancer community is starting to get involved. Um, UIC is leading that, working with many, many organizations around the world. We have a new publication that we're sharing uh, to educate the cancer community. But I agree with you. Why should it stop at the cancer community? I mean, any individual who has an illness uh, has to be treated in hospital is probably exactly the same level of risk of, of you know, getting an infection and then possibly dying of it. So moving away from communities, what about individuals? What can we do individually, uh, Kevin? What should I be doing in, in the way that I operate? I mean, if, if I'm offered an antibiotic by my doctor, because I, should I be asking the question, why are you giving this to me? Should I be challenging that? I mean, what, what is it that I should be doing? 
Well, I'd also I'd always encourage you to have a you know reasonable conversation with your doctor about you know what they're saying. But if you talk to doctors, they they frequently say that that they'll give an antibiotic because the patient is asking for it, or that the physician is feeling pressure uh, to do something. There's a lot of research work that's identified this and, and articulated how this happens. And in the U.S., a lot of physicians are rated um, by the health insurance plan. The patients give them a rating, like a Yelp rating or an Airbnb rating. You know, if, if the doctor tries to be really strict on not giving out antibiotics, all it takes is a couple of patients giving them a one, you know, for there to be trouble with their reimbursement from health insurance. So the, we can be informed patients that ask reasonable questions and don't demand an antibiotic when you have a viral infection. We also have a lot of power as consumers. For years, the Food and Drug Administration tried to regulate the use of antibiotics in the animal agricultural sector in the U.S., and there was a lot of politics, and it didn't go anywhere fast for decades. The biggest change in the past few years in terms of agricultural use of antibiotics in the United States has been major corporations like McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and, and uh, other you know, chain food restaurants and, and big retailers beginning to announce and then implement uh, transitioning to antibiotic-free types of meat. And not just having it as an alternative, you know, but, but making it the default choice, especially for chicken. So our power as consumers is immense. And, and this change happened at these major corporations um, because they were listening to their customers and their customers were saying, we would prefer this. And, and boom, amazing change. Something was politically impossible for decades and people, companies are voluntarily doing it uh, to follow their customers. There's you know, ways to get involved politically to, to make sure that adequate resources are given to this fight in every country. Drug-resistant bacterial infections are killing more people around the world than either HIV or malaria, they're pretty close to the total of HIV and malaria combined. Just think of the global mobilization that's been done against those diseases. That's part of the reason why drug-resistant bacteria kills more, because we've been successful in moving those numbers down. But um, tremendous global effort, lots of political salience, stories in the press and, and everything else. People understand this pro these problems that we need to respond to them. We don't have nearly that level of political, social, you know, emotional mobilization yet against drug resistant bacteria. Well, hopefully the council community, both for individual level and at community level, can make a difference. Uh, Kevin, it's been great talking to you, and thank you very much for giving such great answers to the questions and bringing to light you know, the, the key, cha key challenges we have in this area. Um, UICC will continue to push this around the world to our community. I'm glad that we're working in partnership. Um, I think there's something that we can really uh, shine a light on, and uh, hopefully we can get national governments and global leaders engaged in something that you say is um, a big threat longer term. So thank you very much for your time, Kevin. Really appreciate it. I appreciate the work the UACC is doing uh, to make sure the safety net of antibiotics is there, not just for the ca cancer patients, but for everybody. I hope you enjoyed this new episode. And if you did, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We need to spread the word about antimicrobial resistance and this looming threat to global health. So please do share this episode with others. UICC has a dedicated page to antimicrobial resistance on our website, uicc.org. There you can learn more about AMR and also find a social media toolkit with text and images for you to download and share with your network.